All right. So continuing with the discussion of macroevolution, we'll first refine a little bit our distinction between macroevolution and microevolution and unpack that further as the lecture goes on and then focus on a, a typical macroevolutionary um, process, which are mass extinctions and the five major mass extinctions that have influenced life on Earth in geological history. Probably by the end of this series, we'll have a chance to talk about contemporary life and the question as to whether we're in a sixth mass extinction now um, and whether we should be naming this whole time as a different geological epoch on the basis of human influences on the planet. And um, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit at the end of our discussion of human evolution at the probably the very last step in this, in this section. A case study today on the evolution of whales. The, this, this would be a macroevolutionary phenomenon. How did these highly dedicated aquatic creatures, whales and dolphins, evolve? They're so specialized for a swimming existence. They've lost uh, the traces of their external limbs. They have this strange nose on the top of their head that they blow out of and breathe out of. That's a huge evolutionary step from anything else related to the whales and dolphins. And so the explanation for it, how can we think about that? It's also a nice case study in contemporary biology showing um, considerable differences between molecular biologists and morphologists and paleontologists. So I'll spend some time on that. And then briefly at the end, all too briefly talk about Evo Devo, evolutionary developmental biology, and basically just point you to uh, the interest in the subject on this campus and the possibility of other courses on the subject. We won't be treating it much in here. So a definition, um, sort of traditional of macroevolution, large-scale evolution. In office hours, we've been um, wrestling with that concept of scale and the importance of recognizing what scale, the scale on which you're thinking about biological phenomena, because it's influential. It inf the scale in which you are thinking, the scale in which you, the scale that you've adopted for your perspective, influences your reading of data and the way you present your arguments. And often we end up in debates in biology just because two people are working at different scales. So in one sense, macroevolution is a study of evolution at a large scale. A large scale in what sense? Well, these can be large time scales or deep time scales. Instead of working in the context of population change with the turnover of individuals in a generation, two generations, three generations, Maybe we're talking about thousands or millions of generations of time, deep time scales. High taxonomic levels, instead of looking at questions of speciation and differences between and among populations that might lead to branching events, maybe we're talking about the origin of whole phyla of organisms, or the origin of animals, the origin of the archaea, the origin of life. Those are the big taxonomic scales that you can study evolution on. Um, and often the methods you use, the terms you use, are different and separate from the terms used by, on the smaller scales. So it ends up as an independent field of inquiry. Related, of course. Broad geographic areas. Instead of focusing on this apple orchard versus this stand of hawthorn trees and looking at microevolution on the scale of a landscape, Maybe you're talking about the scale of whole continents or the scale of uh, whole supercontinents. We'll have a chance to look at some plate tectonics here today. Major morphological changes, as in the whales. How do you get these massive shifts in morphology rather than um, new little bumps on bones, little whistles on um, the external anatomy of, a, of an organism? Instead of these little bumps and whistles, how about major changes like the loss of limbs in snakes or uh, other major features like that? 
Four major changes in ecology, diet, <coughs> locomotor pattern, how animals and other organisms move through their environments, major ecological shifts, for example, the origin of photosynthesis, which also entails major physiological changes. So this is one way to think of macroevolution. It's the study of evolution on big scales, whether you're talking about time scales, space, spatial scales, taxonomic scales, and so forth. How the two relate, microevolution and macroevolution, is um, one of the things you, you can wrestle with. So here is a geological scale on the x-axis here. The periods indicated with their um, standard shorthands, the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, etc., and the eras, the three eras that you should become familiar with that follow the Cambrian explosion, that include and follow the Cambrian ex explosion. The Paleozoic era, the Mesozoic era, and the Cenozoic era. And all of those will be discussed today. So those are three of these geological t time groupings that you should become familiar with. There are very few of them that you need to be familiar with. I'll, the ones that you do need to be familiar with, I'll emphasize again and again <clears throat> and put on the terms list which do need an update from me if you've checked them in the last couple of days. So this is a diagram that shows, over time, the number of taxa in major groups on Earth in the form of the number of genera in, um, in multiples of 1,000. So on a scale here of 1 to 5,000, the number of genera over time well-defined genera in green. So the ones that paleontologists are pretty confident about. And then all genera included, including those green, but also the ones that are a little fuzzier, but that are in the literature described as good genera. And what you see over time is this bumpy trend line, smoothed out in the red with a statistically smoothed trend line of increasing diversity, increasing richness of genera, at least. But it's not altogether smooth at a fine scale. It comes with these massive collapses in numbers. Are these real collapses in time? Or do they reflect some problem of the geological record or some lack of emphasis on the part of paleontologists to those times? You might imagine that just on Earth there are very few sediments preserving this time period. And thus, we don't have many genera named because the geological record is poor and the sediments don't exist that might hold the fossils for that time period. Well, that's generally not thought to be the case here. The record, that's, that's taken into consideration usually in analyses like these, those geological flaws. And this is taken at face value, a graph like this, that there were early peaks and spectacular crashes. Peaks and crashes, peaks and crashes. Looks like a lot of other trend lines through time you see. Stock market, for example, that is not dissimilar to a uh, pattern like this. The red lines indicate these massive crashes. Blue the blue triangles, somewhat smaller events. Massive crashes like this one here at the end of the Permian, which demarcates the end of the Paleozoic and the beginning of the Mesozoic, or at the end of the Cretaceous, which demarcates the end of the Mesozoic and the beginning of the Cenozoic. It's not by chance. Biologists from Darwin's time knew of these big events, and they named these eras on the basis of these major transformations. They just didn't have the absolute dates, remember? So it's not by chance that the, I mean, it's specifically related to these phenomena that these eras are named. So these two extinction events, here and here, are the two that I'll focus on. The one at the end of the Permian that marks the end of the Paleozoic, and the one at the end of the Cretaceous that marks the end of the Mesozoic. Those are the ones that we're concerned about of the five. The Phanerozoic refers to this entire time period that includes these three eras. So the Permian 
that last time period in the Paleozoic, was a time of interesting dynamics on terrestrial landscapes. Lots of large vertebrates on the terrestrial landscapes, including these big hulking creatures um, that roughly resemble dinosaurs. If you get, if you go to the a kid's store and you get a little bag of plastic dinosaurs, you'll often have something like this in your little bag of plastic dinosaurs. They're not dinosaurs. They're related to us, in fact. They're on the line that led to mammals. But they're large, hulking things. I mean, as big as this table up front, sometimes with a sail on the back, a fin like that, that may be used for display to other organisms, maybe used as a thermoregulation device for capturing heat on cold mornings or even shedding heat on hot days if open to the, to the wind and allow, allowing for evaporative cooling. These things were dominating the terrestrial landscape in the Permian. They're the primary organisms on the lar of the large fauna on Earth. And they're predators. There's, uh, they're predaceous and um, eating other vertebrates, as well as uh, invertebrates, but other vertebrates like, like amphibians. All this diversity crashed dramatically. What are the numbers? Let me give you a, a couple of estimates for the crash in, um, in Permian diversity here. 96% of marine species, forget the terrestrial stuff, 96% per of marine species appar apparently went extinct in these extinctions. 70% of the terrestrial vertebrates of the sorts that I was just describing, gone without issue. And a whole lot of insects as well in the terrestrial landscape. Paleontologists sometimes speak of extinction without issue, as if the line disappears, leaving no descendants and no traces of itself or um, any, any role for descendants. So totally extinct. Massive crash, maybe the biggest extinction event that Earth has ever witnessed. How long it took isn't that clear. This is a long time ago. This is 250 million years ago. And over time, the fossil record becomes more difficult to interpret in many ways. Because over time, the longer periods of time involve more erosion, more destruction of the record. And 250 million years ago is hard to interpret. But such a tremendous event, particularly in light of contemporary dynamics where we're concerned about mass extinction today, it's a big source of study for biologists. And causes are sought. Naively, humans seem to tend to want to find single causes, a smoking gun, right? A single smoking gun that you can pin the whole event on. One cause for one big effect like this mass extinction. That's something you, if you have a tendency to do it, you know, watch yourself, watch your thought process, particularly when you get into ecological explanations. I referenced this before, but the need to be multi-causal in your explanations, multifactorial in your analyses is relevant, and it may be relevant in these mass extinctions. Maybe we don't need a smoking gun, a single smoking gun. So one of the features of Earth that's relevant in this context, perhaps, is the fact that right around that time, right around 250 million years ago, the Earth continents, the continents of Earth, had coalesced into a single supercontinent, Pangaea, right? You've probably heard the term before. It's a reference to the fact that the land masses on Earth had formed a single land mass, and the rest was ocean. Panthalassa, if you want a name for this great ocean. Thalassa referring to the sea. Or if you're 21 years old, there's a great pool bar down on Shattuck called Thalassa. I don't think they even advertise themselves. But if you want a nice place to gather at night, shoot some pool, maybe. it's called Thalassa, and it has like all these sea motifs inside. Same, same word, but I digress. Panthalassa and Pangaea, Gaia, Earth, Pangaea, one big Earth surface, one big sea surface, just those two phenomena marking the surface of the planet. 
Well, what effect did that have, the coming together of these terrestrial plates into one mass? What effect did that have on life on Earth from a previous condition where those plates were widely separated and there was water in between, many seas? What effect could that have? Can anyone speculate on how that might influence life? could facilitate a gene flow among terrestrial species. Yeah, it could have. Previously separated species now brought together and perhaps increasing gene flow where none existed before. The barriers that existed before having led to differentiation and the accrual of differences coming together and the crossing of boundaries leading to fewer forms. So hybridization, perhaps, and fewer, less diversity. That's a form of extinction for those old lineages, if that were to happen. They've essentially disappeared. They've fused. It's possible. What else? Yeah, how do you know that? What he said was the interiors would be hot and dry of this landmass, and... He reasoned that, I guess, because you wouldn't get the generation of clouds on the coasts where the water is meeting the land that would be reaching this that far into the interior. And that is the case in these situations. The rains that are generated would tend to fall on the coastlines such that by the time these air masses reach the interior, they wouldn't have moisture left in them to drop. So the interiors of these spaces would be, would be arid. If you think of Australia today, this giant landmass of Australia has a very arid and hot interior. And this is a landmass that's centered at, at the equator. So that, that may have just been a relatively desolate space, that interior. Not devoid of life, of course. There'd be all kinds of microbes. But these big terrestrial ecosystems may have been depauperate and have faced extinction as a result of changes in physical conditions like that. Yeah, very good. What else? The loss of the physical differentiation in the sea space is highly relevant because organisms differentiate with relation to the physical environment. A highly differentiated physical space, like a coral reef with all kinds of nooks and crannies, tends to harbor more different life forms. All those separate seas having come together lose their physical complexity and you get a greater uniformity of the coastline, the coastlines of the world. Less linear acreage, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, less linear space for which uh, that organisms can occupy. So less space for organisms in, the, in this highly productive coastal world. All kinds of factors related to the coming together of Pan Pangaea. The changes in sea levels were, changes in sea levels were occurring, with a dropping of sea level, as evidenced by this diagram. Time moving forward in this direction, low sea level stands apparent at that Permo Triassic boundary, exposing more land and providing less area for the. Um, aquatic organisms. Volcanism. Some of the most spectacular examples and richest productions of volcanoes ever seem to have occurred during this period, especially in the Mongolian area, Mongolian traps. And that may have had a global impact through the release of the chemicals that are, are released when in volcanic eruption. For example, uh, heat, uh, heat trapping, greenhouse gases that may have elevated temperatures because there's strong evidence for high temperature increases, high temperature swings upward at this time to the tune of 6, 8, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, potentially, at least. That may have also had a role in the depletion of ozone. Don't need to get into that now. You can study it in ecology. A whole different factor maybe related to these other phenomena, is the possibility that methane, stores of methane in the deep oceans were released in a so-called methane burp, 
or methane belch, as if the seafloor belched out all this methane relatively rapidly. And what does methane do? Well, it, it's an extremely effective greenhouse gas, way more powerful as a trapper of heat than even carbon dioxide, and could have stimulated um, the production of a hotter planet. So we don't know, in sum, what caused the Permian extinctions. These are all possibilities. They're not mutually exclusive. All of them could have played a role, but we should try to find out as much as we can um, in order to understand the process because we're facing similar dynamics in certain respects today. Okay. How can it happen? It's thought to, I mean, there's, she, what she asked was, um, how does a methane belch happen? And yeah, I'm, I'm no expert on that, but it's even thought to be a potential vulnerability to the planet today because there are still vast stores of gaseous methane in the ocean floor. And particularly with the melting that we see at the poles, you're getting the receding of sea ice, the exposure of these sea floors, the warming of these sea floors that can cause the percolation of the methane to be released. And so warming can lead to methane release and further warming. So it has this feedback effect, a positive feedback effect, which is one of the major concerns by a, um, climate scientists today. If you trigger methane release through uh, warming temperatures, you're going to set up a, a very vicious spiral of activity. Geological time scale here, just um, quickly remember this slide, just to illustrate where we are. At the end of the Paleozoic, here, at the end of the Permian. So that was one of those demarcating dates that I was asking you to learn previously. That's where we are. We just talked about that at 250. And the end of the Paleozoic. Now, and we'll get to this end of the Mesozoic in a sec. But what happens after that extinction spasm? From the diagram, it, life's diversity is going to recover, and then some, over time. How long does that take? How does that happen? How does life recover? Does it take a long time? Does it happen quickly? We don't, we're not certain about the Permian extinction event, but the latest, the best recent studies suggest it took a really long time, tens of millions of years, to begin to um, see a, a full recovery of these types of numbers. Is that a long time? I, I don't know. I mean, it depends on your, your perspective. But that's considered longer than previously thought, that it could have taken 10, 40 million years to recover from an episode like this. You can imagine all the ecological space that's available after a collapse, all the physical space, all of the ecological space on the landscapes and seascapes for organisms to exploit, and the possibility of organisms moving into new areas, undergoing evolution, and differentiating into new forms. A relatively well-studied mass extinction event is the one at the end of the Cretaceous. On that previous slide, it was, it was abbreviated by a C. Usually it's referred to with a K instead. So that's a reference to the Cretaceous. And this is a reference to the next time unit, the Paleogene, at the mesozoic Cenozoic boundary the Cretaceous Paleogene extinctions. Used to be called more often the Cretaceous Tertiary extinctions, the KT boundary. Call it the KP boundary, KPG boundary, to be very current. So these end Cretaceous extinctions, well, they involve the loss of all those non-avian dinosaurs, right? All the big um, charismatic dinosaurs, most of which lacked feathers. They went extinct and didn't reappear without issue around 65 million years ago, somewhere between 65 and 66. It's really well dated, these final days. It's well dated on the basis of sediments like these that illustrate the boundary between Cretaceous sediments and Paleogene sediments with volcanic ashes that can be well and accurately dated in sedimentary horizons like that. You've probably heard something about this extinction event because it's in the popular discourse. Yeah, question. 
on the previous slide? Why are there different colors? Well, it may be related to what I was just bringing up, but sediments have different colors depending on their composition and aspects of how they were produced. And that's one of the ways you can read them. You know, these blonde beds lead to these dark brown beds and some gray beds up there. And that's how geologists will refer to them. I'm going out to the gray beds today um, on the basis of these colors. So it's a quick way to get your bearings, just color. And it often indicates something about composition. You've probably heard something about this extinction event, the extinction of the dinosaurs. It's an amazingly successful hypothesis that was advanced to explain this extinction event. And guess what? It, it was advanced by Berkeley scientists, a father and son team here in the geology unit, who suggested that this extinction event was triggered by the impact of an extraterrestrial object. And that satisfies a lot of our human needs for explaining events. We've got one big catastrophe to explain it all. Indeed, one big bolide, one big extraterrestrial object, whammo. Explosion, catastrophe, all of them dead. Right? That's <laughs> Take it, you know, and, and then you can stop thinking about it. It's over. It's done. That has swept the popular mind and the scientific mind as well, outside of a few small groups of paleontologists who scratch their heads and think, wait, that's not how I see the record. So it's interesting because at Berkeley you have the guys who advance that hypothesis and the most uh, coherent formal arguments against the hypothesis, all happening here in, on this campus over the last couple decades, but it's a global source of study, this extinction event. And the compelling evidence that was so persuasive that the Alvarezes over in geology brought to bear on this was the existence of an iridium layer at the KPG boundary. They reasoned if there was an extraterrestrial impact at this boundary, there should be evidence of that impact, perhaps in the form of iridium a chemical element that's relatively rare on Earth, but relatively abundant in extraterrestrial objects. And it's found. They found it, and that was uh, sweeping support for the notion of such an event. They worked around the world, Italy, Denmark, New Zealand, around the world, sampled that contact boundary between the two times and found high levels of iridium in that very layer. Here's the boundary, and in limestone, in these marine sediments, where the iridium would settle out and be registered, they found peaks in the clays at those boundaries at, in different parts of the world. That's, that's fantastic. You have a hypothesis, you seek evidence in support of it maybe, or attempt to refute it, and um, it was published in 1980. You can click. These are clickable. I think I've mentioned that, right? But references like these, if you want to geek out on references like these, click them and read the original study on, on the PDF. Um, and rightfully renowned, these investigators are for this work. There's even, this happened later, the finding of a site, a specific crater that happened around that time that could be the very crater where the impact occurred. And it's off of Mexico. It's called the Chicxulub Crater. Dating by Berkeley scientists a couple years ago, really refined dating on that crater showed it to be exactly 65, 5, 66 million years ago. So it's right at the time you want it. The early dates were a little rougher and thought to be in the neighborhood. Well, they're right on target. So now you've got a don't you have a smoking gun now? Paleontologists have looked at the record, whether it's the mammals or the dinosaurs. They see changes in the vertebrate communities prior to this event. That there's evidence for a loss of diversity to some degree in different groups before the impact. So other people interpret, can interpret these phenomena as this being the straw that broke the camel's back but that there was a stressed system of life prior to this event. So this could have been um, what put it over the top, but open for more study. One of the problems is we don't have good 
fo a good fossil record for that boundary and the years just leading up to it. Some of the best fossils are in the United States for that period. We have the contact layers, but not fossiliferous layers to really get a good handle on this. How would that have happened? What role would an extraterrestrial impact have had? In a spectacular um, interpretation, it would have involved a sort of nuclear winter with the expulsion of all this debris into the upper atmosphere, blocking out the sun, causing changes in chemistry on life on Earth, causing rapid cooling in the blocking out of the sun, and everything freezes and is poisoned and absolutely miserable for life on Earth, and everything crashes. Well, this is a more selective mass extinction. Mass extinctions, by definition, involve a wide range of life forms. They don't just focus on particular groups of organisms. And this one's true, too. It happens to marine life, terrestrial vertebrates, invertebrates, plants. But not all organisms are affected in the same way. Some come through quite well. Turtles, for example, cruise right through. Some groups of mammals cruise right through. Some plants cruise right through. So it has differential impact, but it is a mass extinction. It's a true mass extinction. Here's your boundary there, Mesozoic to Cenozoic. And there you have a mammal thumbing its nose at the large terrestrial vertebrates. That can illustrate a couple things. Well, for one, remember the birds come through. So the feathered dinosaurs make it through this boundary. It's these types. This would be an ancestor of the feathered dinosaur, T-Rex type. That's in the group that led to birds. So maybe put it on some wings and have it fly through. The pterodactyls, no, out. These large terrestrial dinosaurs like stegosaurs and so forth, out. One of the things this cartoon illustrates is that the humans, the human mammal, and these big creatures did not live together. A very bad misconception that's common in the public to imagine that cave people lived with dinosaurs in a sort of land of the lost scenario. If you've ever seen those reruns. I grew up with that show, great show. Um, no, humans didn't live with these creatures, but some mammals did. The ancestors of these creatures were alive back here and came through the boundary, but the humans themselves, no. That's much later in the process, much later in the Cenozoic, and we'll be focusing on that um, in the next couple lectures. The mammals did radiate after that extinction event. The old story goes that the mammals radiated right after that extinction event. The extinction event's here in the red line. That right after that extinction event, the mammals found the the mammals that were present before it, before the extinction event, but relatively minor players in these ecosystems, radiated, exploded on the Earth's surface in diversity and in uh, biomass, in importance energetically on Earth. That's received support. That old story received support in a major study from a couple years ago that, fa that looked at the fossil record in detail and found that the major groups of modern mammals radiated after the boundary and soon after the boundary, maybe in a few hundred thousand years after that boundary. So th this study found strong support for that traditional narrative of massive explosion of life in the form of mammalian life after the boundary. The molecular data, based on molecular clock information, the geneticists, tend to date this explosion much earlier than the boundary. So they see a long fuse back into the Mesozoic prior to this explosion. So a long burning fuse in the Mesozoic and then an explosion. As opposed to the paleontologists that see the explosion with just a short fuse that's burned mostly since that boundary. So a, a difference of opinion a difference in um, an analysis of the data on the part of molecular biologists and paleontologists. And that is a di difference of opinion that exists um, frequently in recent years between molecular biologists and morphologists or paleontologists. 
The whales present a good example of that. Whales and dolphins, the cetaceans, right? These are mammals, the whales and dolphins. Not pictured here yet, but um, they're not fish, right? These things swim in the ocean. They kind of look like fish, but they have hair. They have, they produce milk. They have the features of mammals. And Aristotle knew that. We've known that for a long time. Although you still ask people on the street, and they'll say that maybe a dolphin is a fish. No, it's not. It's a mammal. So where did these funny mammals come from, these aquatic mammals known as cetaceans? Paleontologists had an idea that they came from things like mesonychids, these wolf-like creatures that came more and more to hunt in the waters and somehow evolved into whales. And that was based on some superficial similarities of the teeth of these creatures, teeth being very important to mammologists and paleontologists. So the wolf-like mesonychids were thought to be ancestral to whales based on some similarities in the teeth. But molecular analyses from the earliest days, from the simplest earliest days of comparing proteins, for example, the proteins in the lenses of the eyes of mammals, not genetic analysis, but molecular analysis of different um, non, uh, outside the DNA, supported a link between the cetaceans and artiodactyls, ungulates, like cows and pigs and hippopotamuses hoofed mammals. So this connection that molecular biologists were making, the paleontologists would scratch their head and say, you're nuts. You're comparing these molecules, linking the molecules of the whales to the molecules of hippopotamus and saying they're similar and thus these organisms belong in a clade together? You're nuts. And that started in the 60s and the 70s. And the two groups um, never could come to terms. So what this um, example provides is also a nice example of the coming together of two communities in the analysis of data. What the paleontologists agreed on was that there was an ancestral type of cetacean called Pachycetus, and it had four legs, four good legs. Details of the ear, the structure of the ear, allowed paleontologists to connect this old fossil organism, Pachycetus, to cetaceans. And they were put into a phylogeny with other fossil organisms that showed reduction in the limbs that fit a nice sequence, a nice series, leading to your modern whales. But pachycetus, and then mesonychids were put out here. Okay, so it's the mesonychids, then a pachycetus type, and then these whales. That was the paleontological story. The molecular biologists are studying more and more molecules, including DNA, and drawing an even closer and closer link to the ungulates, the more they learn. Mm -hmm. One of the key characteristics of ungulates is a bone in the ankle called a ta the talus. You have a talus in your ankle. It's the second biggest bone in your ankle. It's a talus or an astragalus. And your talus has one little spool-like structure, one of these little spool-like structures on it that your, your tibia rides on and allows you to, to, um, to flex your ankle. Well, artiodactyls, like pigs, this is a pig's ankle bone, it has two of those. It has two trochlea, or two pulley-shaped surfaces. And artiodactyls, are the only creatures among the mammals, or, well, it's a major hallmark of the artiodactyls. You're, you, all, all the artiodactyls have it. Well, what do creatures like Pachycetus have in their ankle? Do they have an artiodactyl ankle or an ankle like a mesonychid and a wolf, which has one pulley-shaped surface? Well, no one knew because no ankles were preserved. So by amazing coincidence, two teams of investigators. This team, in 2001, found the ankle of Pachycetus in Pakistan or, or India, somewhere over there, and found that in that ankle was a astragalus that had a double trochlea on it, the hallmark of being an artiodactyl. So the paleontologists, almost overnight, as a result of 
that finding and the finding of Rhodocetus and its ankle by a separate team of investigators published in the same year, also with a double trochlea on it. So almost overnight, the paleontologists came around to the old molecular hypothesis that the whales were related to the ungulates, and specifically related to groups like hippopotamus. And so whales now fall in a clade with hippopotamus, according to all analyses available. In that sense, the whales are artiodactyls. Ardi They're in the artiodactyl clade. And you have to um, change the, you don't have to change your name, you just still call it artiodactyls, but you recognize a new member in the form of the whales. Recently, a new fossil was found in the form of this guy, Indohyus. Here's a, this is obviously life on Earth today. Here's a little creature called Hyamascus, living in a rainforest and fleeing a big bird here. Jumps into the water, fleeing this big bird of prey, and dives under the water to escape that bird, and essentially runs on the bottom of the water. It's got heavy bones, this little Hyamascus, and is capable of getting down to the bottom and running along the, the substrate. To, to flee predators. Well, indo -hyas, this thing was found around 50 million years ago. And it also has the heavy bones, typical of a mammal that can sink and perform effectively below the water surface. So this is now one of the candidates for cetacean ancestry. It has the proper bones of the teeth and the inner ear to support a link. So maybe your whale ancestors, something like this, that over time, under natural selection, begins to lose the limbs and become more dedicated to swimming. See how this is a macroevolutionary process? You can't study changes in alleles in these systems in order to uh, illustrate the process. You don't have access to them. You can't get the DNA out of them to do that. You study the fossils, you make cladograms, you study living forms like Hyamascus, and piece together the story from details like that. A provocative quote by an iconoclastic scientist who died not too long ago, Lee Van Valen. Something to keep in mind through the rest of the course, especially when you study ecology. This was a person who was dissatisfied with the modern synthesis, neo-Darwinism, and the definition of evolution as changes in gene frequencies in populations. And Van Valen said, no, evolution is the control of development by ecology. And that's, that little aphorism has become popular in certain communities as a different view of evolution. All organisms have some sort of developmental trajectory, right? They're ontogeny. O-N-T-O-G-N-Y. Their ontogeny, or development, relates to their evolution, or their phylogeny. So the phylogeny and the ontogeny relate together in an evolutionary developmental biology. And if ecology is the influence, if evolution is the influence of ecology on development, then you can study evo-devo-eco as a little package to really illustrate major features of the evolutionary process. And this is just what I want to point you to as um, possibilities for study, particularly in other courses. Not, you don't get much of an introduction in your intro bio classes to this. But it's Evo Devo, and the campus here has uh, excellent professors and courses in the subject. One of the major ways in which this can happen is just by s relatively simple changes in the timing of developmental phenomena, changes in timing and rate of development. If you think about the great sabers of a saber-toothed tiger, this is your state fossil, Smilodon, saber-toothed cat. There's a statue of one over by geology, if you haven't seen it. Well, these massive canines, so long, can grow by simply continuing their development while the development of the other teeth is arrested. Genetically, that's not a difficult process in certain respects. 
changing the timing such that the switch to turn off the development of the other, of these teeth, is enthroned, and the development of these teeth continue into the form of grossly elo elongated canines, sabers. That's a change in timing, a heterochrony, a heterochronic shift in development that could be triggered by ecological dynamics, changes in diet, changes in prey, changes in intraspecific relationships, some other ecological relationship, influencing development, having an impact on evolution. The phenomenon of pedomorphosis may be more important in more areas than considered. This is a funny little face of a creature called axolotl. Axolotl is an amphibian that retains its gills as an adult. Amphibians, according to the normal life cycle, develop first in water from an egg. Eggs are laid in water. They form tadpoles. They breathe in the water with the aid of gills. And then they move on to land for their adult life and lose the gills and breathe through their lungs. They're amphibios. They're living two lives, water and land. Well, little axolotl stays in the water in adulthood, and it keeps its baby gills as an adult. So the adult form retains a juvenile feature, namely the gills. It's pedomorphic or neotenic in retaining juvenile traits into adulthood. A major change in the ecology of that organism, so it's water dwelling as an adult, and in its morphology, just related to a developmental change whereby the gills are not, um, not retracted, not dissolved away during development, during ontogeny. Final thing to consider is whether humans are neotenic, pedomorphic, this was an idea um, that became popular with Stephen Jay Gould, the architect of the punctuated equilibrium idea. When you look at baby chimpanzees, one of our closest relatives, right? They have little round skulls with flat, short faces that develop into adults with more stretched skulls, heavy brow ridges, and prognathic faces that stick out. This is more like us. We, in the fetal form, have a skull that very much resembles that. The adult skull form is less deviant from that original type than the chimpanzee adult. So the argument is that humans are retaining the pedomorphic juvenile traits. Humans are retaining the juvenile traits into adulthood. And this might allow some aspects, for example, of brain expansion and changes in the dentition that are typical in human evolution. So think about that if you want, whether humans are pedomorphic. All right, talk to you on Friday. <laughs>